confession of faith, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Let's all greet one another. The title today is The Faith That Seizes the Opportunity. One of the things many people regret in life is missing out on opportunities that come their way. And some people don't realize when opportunities present themselves and they let them slip by. And it's only after a long time has passed, they realize, oh, that was an opportunity. And others hesitate, and then they lose their opportunity. And then they end up regretting it, thinking, oh, I should have seized that opportunity. And that's why Richard Branson, the chairman of the famous Virgin Group, known for his creative and bold business strategies, said this, If someone offers you an amazing opportunity and you're not sure you can do it, say yes. Say yes and then learn how to do it later. So he's saying you must seize every opportunity that comes your way. It's an expression of very solid determination that one must seize every opportunity. And this also applies to our spiritual life. When an opportunity arises for us to experience the living works of God, it should never be missed. When you receive grace from the Word, the thing that should never be missed or that should never that we should never lose hold of and a very representative example is your church position and you must recognize that when a church position or role has been given to you, God is giving you the channel to receive blessings. And God has provided you an opportunity to enlarge the place of our physical and spiritual tent. So you must not be deceived and lose your opportunities because you limit yourselves and look at your own abilities and circumstances. If God has given you the role within the church, He has also given you the ability to fulfill that position. Of course, the Galilee fishermen, they didn't have anything. How could they have become apostles? It's not us that are doing it, but the fact that when God calls you, He also gives you the power to fulfill that role. And now that the Lunar New Year has ended, it is time to really focus on carrying out the mission given to us by God. So God gave us the covenantal message of enlarging the place of your tent. Then that clearly indicates that there is a place of my tent that must be expanded. Whether it's the tents of your church roles, your ministry, and your businesses, God has given you the opportunity to stand as a witness that possesses all the nations that have been given. And as much as you realistically grab hold of the opportunities given to you and make covenantal challenges, you will experience answers accordingly. And today's title is The Faith That Seizes the Opportunity. So seizing opportunities is faith. And in today's passage, we see people rejecting Jesus due to the lack of faith to seize opportunities. And although Jesus was born in Bethlehem, he grew up in Nazareth. That's why Jesus is referred to as Jesus of Nazareth. That's his hometown. He is from Nazareth. Yet the people from his hometown who thought they knew Jesus better than anyone rejected him. 
They believed they knew Jesus the best, but in reality, they were the ones who knew him the least. And this situation is very similar to people right now who go to church and they say they attend church. But when asked the question, who is Jesus? They hesitate. And there are many people who hesitate before that question. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Christ, the solution to all of our problems. I'm sure all Yewon believers will confidently be able to proclaim that. And rather, we will all become excited to proclaim this gospel that we know. However, many other churchgoers, they still cannot give this answer. They fail to explain why believing in Jesus leads to salvation. We must be able to explain that. We must be able to explain based on biblical evidence. But there are many people who are unable to do that even though they go to church. So anyone who still has not come to that answer, anyone who still hesitates to evangelize, I will organize it in a simple manner with seven Bible verses. So the Old Testament talks about Jesus who will come. And what's the New Testament? It talks about Jesus who came. And so the first Bible verse is Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. It says the Son will come and He will be the one to save His people. So Jesus means the Savior. And how did He save? It's contained in the six verses within Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. So we were separated from God. We left God because we ate the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And in order to return back to God, we need to have Jesus who says that he is the prophet and he is the way, truth, and life, the only way to meet God. That's in John chapter 14, verse 6. And what did Jesus do while he was here? He acted as a true prophet to help people meet God. And what was the purpose of why Jesus came? What is the purpose of believing in Jesus? It's because we need to redeem our sins. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, he says, All people have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All people are sinners. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1 to 2, Anybody who is within the law of life has been freed from the law of sin and death. It's a spiritual liberation. Nothing can save you from the original sin. Our original sin problem cannot be solved. And so only when we believe in Jesus who came as a true priest can we be freed from our sins. And without Jesus, you cannot meet God. Without Jesus, you cannot go to heaven. That's why Jesus came as the Christ. And one of the roles that he fulfilled was being this priest. That's why if you believe in Jesus, you do not have sin. The moment you believe, you do not have sin. So even if you commit the same sin as someone who doesn't believe in God and Jesus, you will still be redeemed of that sin and because the moment you believe in Jesus, you've been forgiven of all sin. That's why we come before Jesus and the cross and repent before Jesus. But because non-believers do not know repent, they have to pay the price for all of their sins. That's why they go to hell. We committed the same sin. However, we have received redemption through the blood of Christ, and that's why we go to heaven. So original sin or the everyday sins we commit, we've already been redeemed of all of that sin and received the liberation. That's why Jesus came as the Christ. And 
And lastly, John 8, 44, it talks about the devil that is the king of all things on earth. Because of our original sin, it says in the verse, you are of your father, the devil. So everybody who is a descendant of Adam, we are a child of the devil. But why did Jesus come? He came as the one to crush the head of Satan. That's in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. That's why we must meet Jesus so that we can be solved of the three original problems and receive the spiritual healing. And so Jesus is the one who came to fulfill those three roles. And that's why he's the anointed one as well. That's why Jesus is the Christ. And those who believe in that Jesus are the ones who have been freed and solved of everything. That's why we say Jesus is the solution to all problems. That's why you, you do not have any problems. You may have introductory problems, but they're just introductory things. Do not fall into trials because of those introductory things. And people in the world live according to the introductory things. And all religions are held up in the introductory things. But we are able to transcend all of those problems. And that's why Jesus also says those who do not have sin, they can stone uh, the women who cheated. However, no one was able to throw the stones. And Jesus was able to forgive that woman. Because to that extent, all of those introductory things are not important. And murderers as well. If you come before Jesus, you can receive forgiveness. And he made disciples of everyone, even the tax collector at the time. But because the churches right now are so caught up in the introductory things, they are divided within, within the church. But Jesus, he came to solve the most important problem of our lives. And that's why you must organize these, these seven Bible verses and you must be able to proclaim that and give the accurate answer. And so I bless in the name of the Lord that you become absolute disciples of Christ that grow in firm faith in each step of your lives. The first point, the decisive reason for missing the opportunity. Verse 1 reads, He went away from there and came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. The word there here is referring to Capernaum. So Jesus did many activities in Capernaum, the central city of Galilee. And so he performed miracles of healing the sick. And he taught the gospel to people in the synagogue. And so in Capernaum, a large crowd followed Jesus. And they heard the word of the gospel. And they it was an atmosphere of cheering and um, having a feast among themselves. And so it was like a huge sensation. And within this situation, Jesus takes a brief moment to visit his hometown, Nazareth. And so at age 30, he left his hometown and it hasn't been three years because he died on the cross at 33. And so for the first time after leaving, he went back to his hometown. And actually, in a way, it could be described as Jesus' return home in glory because he became such a sensation in the world. However, when he returns to his hometown, the situation flows very strangely. Verses 2 to 3 reads, And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus did not visit his hometown simply to rest. As soon as he went back, he went into the synagogue and proclaimed the word on the Sabbath. No matter where he was, no matter what situation he was, Jesus placed all focus on spreading the gospel of heaven. And Jesus especially would have wanted the people of his hometown to hear the gospel and live a life of true salvation. 
In other words, it's evangelism, evangelism of the bone of flesh. And so when Jesus was teaching the gospel of heaven in the synagogue, people were very shocked. And we can see that Jesus also performed miracles there because it says, what is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? And the problem was that despite being surprised hearing Jesus' word, they did not believe him, but instead they rejected him. A lot of people believed in him and they were astounded by his works and they accepted Christ. However, here instead of believing him, they rejected him. When they saw Jesus teaching the word and performing miracles in the synagogue, the people realized that this was not the same Jesus that was the carpenter from the past, the same Jesus that they used to spend time with. And they were greatly intrigued and curious by how Jesus could acquire such wisdom and power in such a short amount of time. And they say, what is the wisdom given to him? In other words, this Jesus that they knew so well, they couldn't overcome this level of curiosity they had. They couldn't overcome that curiosity. But you cannot receive salvation with curiosity. There are many people who come to church with curiosity, but they stop there and they are unable to receive salvation. Most of all, the decisive reason why the people of Nazareth did not believe and even rejected Jesus was because they had the wrong bias and prejudice. So Nazareth was the place Jesus resided in for 30 years before his public ministry, and he was a carpenter there. And the people there assumed that they knew more about Jesus than anyone else. And they say, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? And even the way they refer to Jesus in this verse is very disrespectful. And instead of saying the son of Joseph, they say the son of Mary. And as the society at that time was very focused on patriarchy, describing someone by the name of a woman was unusual. It could have been because Jesus had passed early on, but it was mostly said in a mocking manner. In the past, our country also used to say a fatherless child as an insult, although the phrase has become uncommon now. And so the Nazareths were captured by stereotypes and prejudice and only looked at Jesus with their physical eyes. And a lot of people within the church look with the physical eyes as well and they think that person is like this, this person is like that, and the church is like this. And so if you look with the physical eyes, they took offense and they rejected him. And they would think, you're just a carpenter. How could you be doing all these things? And they would say, go, leave this place. They did not know that Jesus was the Christ who came to solve the problem of Genesis chapter 3, the fundamental problem. They couldn't believe that this Jesus they knew well was the Christ. And if you look at the word took offense from the scripture, in, in the terminology from nowadays, it would be more like they bullied him or outcasted him. And in the original language, the meaning is a little bit different. The original Greek phrase, take offense, is scandalizo, which means trap or snare or trick. So this phrase interpreted could be translated to say that they were ensnared and had stumbled because of Jesus. Knowing the background and status of Jesus all too well, they were rather offended by Jesus and did not accept him when they saw his wisdom and authority. 
they thought, why are you boasting? We know you well. We know what you're truly like. So why are you showing off? They were offended by him. Many people within the church that cannot receive grace, they also show this kind of um, sense of being offended by things. And so foolishly and pitifully, they kicked away their own opportunity for change and growth because of those introductory things, because of their stereotypes and prejudice. And it is said that these days, it is an age where we have 10 million pets, household pets. And in Dubai, they even have a hotel for dogs. It's a hotel for dogs, and it's a five-star hotel. So it's so such a great hotel that even people could come and stay there. And they're not lacking in anything, even though it's a dog hotel. To that extent, many people care about their pets. And I also really love dogs. And I had a husky once, and even a poodle. But people around me didn't really like the dogs that I had. But actually, people, regardless of whether they hate or like dogs, has two pets inside of their hearts. And the names of those pets are their stereotypes and prejudice. And so people who do not raise pets, who do not raise dogs, they don't really understand the people who do raise them. And not really cats, but more so dogs, they really bring people um, a lot of joy and comfort and they really relieve stress for the people. And especially dogs, they really come and greet their owners and make them be in a better mood. So normally pets bring such joy and comfort. However, the stereotypes and prejudice that we have bring the complete opposite. They are very dangerous because they narrow our perspectives. They make us focus only on our own thoughts. So the decisive reason why we cannot open our eyes of faith is because of this bias and pre prejudice that we have. And so Apostle Paul prays in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 to 19, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might. And so like this prayer, I bless all Year One Church believers in the name of the Lord to open your spiritual eyes and experience God's abundant grace and be people of true faith who sees the opportunity of growth and change. The second point is the power that is experienced when one believes. Verse 4 reads, And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. Jesus mentions that prophets cannot receive honor from their hometown relatives and household. And so the families of pastors or the families of evangelists, many people do not know who their partners are or, or their family members are. And that's actually normal because it's even stated in the Bible that way. When they leave their hometown and leave their household and relatives, they receive a lot of respect. But back home, they do not. And even in Mark chapter 3, verse 21, Jesus was treated as a maniac by his own family members. And in verse 31, you can see that Mary and his brothers and sisters came to find him. 
Why did they come to find him? Because there were rumors going about saying that Jesus was, had, had gone crazy. And so they had come to take him home. And so Jesus was already misunderstood a lot by his family and relatives. And now he was being rejected by people from his own hometown. And there's a reason Jesus says this. And verse 1 hints at this. When Jesus traveled to Nazareth, his disciples followed him. And furthermore, the word in verse 4 was not addressed to the people of Nazareth. They were addressed to the disciples that had come with him. And so he was giving this audio and visual education about what would happen to the disciples in the future. He showed them that they would also be misunderstood and insulted and humiliated and ostracized just like Jesus was being treated. They would not live a life of receiving applause and cheers like that of Capernaum, but they would also be treated this way that Jesus was being treated by the people that were closest to him. And so he was teaching them Grow your hearts and grow your vessels and grow to a spiritual level where you can let problems and events pass without being scarred and despaired in the face of these problems and incidents. And so family members can be the ones to really bring you down so that you cannot do the evangelism movement and you cannot do the gospel movement and the missions movement. And they really bring you down and make you lose a lot of strength and you cannot do anything. But no matter what situation comes, no matter what persecution your family members may inflict on you, I hope you're able to overcome that. That's what Jesus is trying to say. Because Jesus was not scarred at all by the rejection from his hometown. Instead, he felt pity for their unbelief. And verse 6 says, Jesus marveled because of their unbelief. That's what it says. And the literal translation is basically that Jesus was astonished at their unbelief. So if he proclaims the gospel of the heavens, you should be saying amen and accepting that. And so he was astonished and shocked that people were instead rejecting that gospel. And so Jesus was deeply saddened by the actions of unbelief and rejection of his hometown. And so if you look at the children of some famous pastors, there aren't many children that live a good walk of faith. It's very strange. They ha look with the physical eyes and so their faith does not grow. However, Jesus was not bothered by the situation at all and once again preaches the gospel of heaven. It says, and he went about among the villages teaching. This is how our walk of faith should be as well. It should be a, a life that is completely free from being controlled by the visible problems and events and words of others. And people will judge and people will criticize you. And it'll be like... It'll be like your inviting people to say what they want about you. And you might even say, how come I'm receiving this criticism when all I did was really give my all before God? And normally people might fall into trial because of that, especially people who work and uphold their church roles without any faith. And when they lose that strength, then they stop coming to church. And then they go somewhere else, but the problem repeats. And let's look at verse 5. So Jesus did not do a great and mighty work because of the unbelieving attitude of the people of Nazareth. 
And so it's a very pitiful situation. And in Matthew 13, 58, it precisely says Jesus did not do many works there because of their unbelief. If you do not believe, if you do not have faith, then, you've, then you will not experience the powers and works that God wishes to perform. Your faith will not grow. The power does not come upon those who do not believe. And so the people of Nazareth, they had a really big loss. They lost that precious opportunity to experience that. And so you must be grateful that you are able to come to Yewon Church and live a walk of faith. You're here listening to the clear gospel, and you're able to receive grace and receive true growth. And if you cannot, then that's a big personal problem, really caught up in your own thoughts and bias and prejudice. You're really losing all the blessings. If you're only here to, as a bystander, then you're really losing hold of everything and you're just taking up space at our church. And Satan is deceiving you so that you will not grow. And even when you go home, even when you go to work, Satan continues to attack you so that you fall into unbelief. Really open your spiritual eyes and see that. You must be able to spiritually interpret these situations. However, there's something that we need to look at, which is that even among the situation, a few sick people received healing. Because it says, except that he had laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Although the ma majority of Nazareth did not believe in Jesus, it indicates that there were a few believers among them. And they were able to experience the power of Jesus in their lives and receive the benefit of believing in Jesus. And so when one believes, you can witness the glory of God. And there's a common question asked when buying something from each country, for, for each country. And Americans reportedly ask, what is the most expensive? Germans ask, what is the sturdiest? And the French ask, what the newest product is? So what do you think Koreans often ask when buying something? They ask, is this really authentic? And that's how skeptical and untrusting Koreans are. It's the characteristic of, Christ of Koreans. We are very doubtful and untrusting. And no matter where you go in the world, Koreans have a very strong expression. It's like a frown. If you go anywhere else in the world, people have very nice and relaxed faces. But in Korea, you look around and people are all so um, sensitive and they're looking at you as if asking you, why are you staring at me? And there's a lot of unhappiness within them. And within the OECD countries, Korea is known to be the nation with the lowest rate of happiness. And we're, the, we're really smart. Only Koreans really have the IQ with three numbers. However, we're also caught up in the introductory things within the unbelief that Satan plants within us. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 9 says, If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. Only when you're firm in faith will you stand firmly. Do not be doubtful. Being doubtful means Satan has taken hold of you. Those who are doubtful, their faith cannot grow. And those who are doubtful, they're very spiritually ill. Really choose to believe, choose to have faith. And I bless, I bless all year one church believers in the name of the Lord to have firm faith and live firmly and be the people of absolute faith who establish the firm partisan of Christ Jesus. This is the conclusion. There's a term called Niagara Syndrome. And this term refers to the symptom of being swept along in the river of life without any thought much like being carried away by a river. And simply put, it's living a life where you just waste time and let life go by you. 
So it describes living an indefinite and unconscious life within various social environments until one day, suddenly startled by the rushing current and the turbulent sound, one realizes that they have arrived at the brink of Niagara Falls. By then, it's already too late. You're going to fall off. And it's a steep fall. And so the same applies to the spiritual life. You must be spiritually awake. Tell it the kum, rise up and wake up. So if you do not have the spiritual eyes to see those things, then it would be meaningless. Oh, even with the choir praise today, it says tell it the kum. You must interpret that with the spiritual eyes. God is telling me to wake up and rise up and go to the field. Tell it the kum, rise up. It says wake up, and it doesn't mean from physical sleep, but it means spiritually be awake. And I hope you believe that God is speaking to you. Really be spiritually awake so that you must not miss the opportunities given to you. Those who are spiritually dim, they will... They will receive misfortune. So really pray to God and say, please awaken my spiritual eyes. Let me be spiritually awake every single day. And pray, let me live a life of faith that does not miss opportunities. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. It says now. Do you think you'll be here for many years to come and be healthy for many years to come? You don't know what will happen to you. You don't know what could happen at any moment. So may all Yewon Church believers be 24 hours within the pulpit. And therefore, I bless in the name of the Lord that you stand as main figures of change who realistically taste answers according to the time schedule of the pulpit and enlarge the place of your tents. Let us pray. Father God, allow all of our believers to hold on to the faith that seizes opportunities. And let us realize that when we have faith, we'll be able to see your glory and really be able to experience the immense blessings that you wish to give to us. Let us stay awake and seize those blessings and opportunities and make them our own with the faith that we have. Let us become the people of this sort of faith. I pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.